Good morning, greetings, and welcome. We're so glad you have decided to join us today for our worship service. Psalms 100 says, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. This day and every day, we are to give God thanks and bless his holy name. Let us pray. We sing and speak your praises, O Lord. Grateful for the many ways in which you have healed us. Keep our hearts, our minds, and our spirits open to learn ways in which we can offer healing love for others. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship. Though the storm clouds and the fear threatens to overcome us, God lead us into ways of peace. When the darkness of war and the deep pit of anger reaches toward us, God lift and carry us through the darkness with hope and light. Lord of hope and light, be with us today. God of mercy and peace, lead our lives. Amen. 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 Yeah, I, I, I see them. They got little pictures on the side and it got called. Them. Maybe I Oh, lucky stars, it's not my end. 
together. Let us unite in this historic confession Free. of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. At this time, let us prepare our hearts to go before God in prayer. Lord. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your amazing Lord. grace and awesome love. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for our salvation. We say thank you for blessing us 
and supplying all of our needs. Thank you, Lord, for everything. Thank you, Lord. It's been a busy, it's been a long and busy week, Lord. Our lives are rushed and we are overwhelmed. There's always something, Lord, pressing for our attention. So this morning, Lord, I pray for you to direct our hearts, our minds towards you, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Renew our minds. Cleanse our hearts of all unrighteousness. Turn our hearts toward you, Lord, this morning. At this very moment, wipe away all negative thoughts and cares of this world. Help us to focus our hearts on you and only you, Lord. Turn off the distractions. Lord, forgive us for being too busy and distracted to spend time with you this week, Lord. Forgive us for not following your ways nor doing your will. Holy Spirit, reveal to us any unconfessed sins in our heart. We humbly confess our sins this morning, Lord, before you, and we say thank you because you are faithful and just and will forgive us, Lord, of all of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Heavenly Father, my prayer is for everyone to be saved. I pray that we will love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. Help us, help us to show love to one another, Lord. I pray to Heavenly Father for those in need, for the sick, for those in the hospital, and for those who face troubles in their lives, Lord. Lord, give strength and heal those who are sick, lonely, and depressed. I pray for the well-being of all people, Lord. Have mercy on us. I pray for the poor, the sick, those who are hungry, homeless, those that are in prison, unemployed, face financial need, unemployed, whatever their need might be, Lord, I pray for them at this time. I pray for those who have need, for those to have the Father that have need, and for those that are suffering, especially those that are facing natural disaster, the people in California, the people that face hurricanes in the midst of this pandemic. I pray for justice and peace for our nation. Lord, give us courage and hope in the midst of our troubles. Deliver us, Lord, from whatever we are facing in our lives. Give strength to the weary, help to those in need, and heal those who are broken and lost. Draw them near to you this morning, Lord. Allow them to feel your love. I pray that we will not take your love for granted, Lord, that we will love you in return. Shine your light in us, through us, and over us, Lord. Help us to keep you first in our hearts and life. I pray for your protection over our lives and our families. Cover us and keep us from evil and all hurt, harm, and danger. Help us to understand your will, hear your voice, and know your way. I pray that we will make a difference in the world, Lord. 
that we will bring you glory in everything we say and do. Lord, help us through this difficult season. God, we need you more than ever. Lord, people are hurting in silence, struggling through brokenness, overwhelmed with life problems, cannot see their way through. Bless them to be encouraged, Lord. Help them to have hope and peace in the midst of their darkness. Allow them to experience your love today, Lord. Holy Spirit, teach us how to pray and what to pray for. If ever there was a need for prayer, Lord, that need is now. So teach us, Lord, as you talk to your disciples. Help us to not allow fear and worry to control our mind, but to trust your promises, Lord. Heavenly Father, help us to grow closer to you and to seek you in the midst of this pandemic. Heavenly Father, I pray for the frontline workers. I pray that you will refresh them, renew them, and strengthen them for the months to come. I pray that our healthcare system will not be overwhelmed, which will lead to more deaths. Lord, slow the spread of this virus. I pray for our nation leaders. Bless them, Lord, with godly wisdom so that your will will be done on earth. I pray for those members, Lord, on our sick and shut-in list. Lord, comfort them, strengthen them, and heal them, Lord. I, I pray that you will watch over and bless Pastor Lanier and his family. I pray for the Poplar Spring and New Redemption Church family. Bless them, Lord, and supply all of their needs. I pray that as we hear your message today from Reverend Dr. Byron Thompson, that our faith will be increased. Heavenly Father, hear our prayer. Heal our land. We need you, Lord. Have mercy on us. This is my prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Glory to God. Amen. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Next we have our scripture. by Sister Teresa Matthews. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, 
but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. To one is given through the spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same, by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same spirit who allots to each one individually just as the spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Amen. Amen. Next up, let us prepare our hearts from the, for the message, which will be delivered today by Reverend Dr. Byron Thompson. Let us welcome Dr. Thompson. Several years ago, walking became a part of my exercise routine. It was not uncommon for me to walk six or seven miles. And while walking was good for my health, walking was also a time for reflection, for prayer, for breathing fresh air, and for allowing God's creation to minister to me. But while I enjoyed the benefits of walking, after after a while, I noticed that my back started hurting. No matter how much I stretched before I exercised, at some point along the way, it became less comfortable for me to walk. And so after doing some research, I made an appointment to see a chiropractor. On the day of my appointment, I arrived at the office, signed in, and was then escorted to a room adjacent to the reception area where I was offered a seat and told that the doctor would be with me shortly. And after a few minutes passed, the doctor came in, introduced herself, and asked me to tell her what was going on. After I shared with her the reason why I had made the appointment, she explained to me the chiropractic approach to health. She talked to me about the spine and its purpose and how it functioned, how it was critical to protect the spinal cord and the internal organs, and how it provided structure and balance for the body and even the role it played in enabling flexibility. She then informed me that she would like to begin my examination. She had me to stand and then she took some measurements and then she had me to lie down and took further measurements. She showed me the math and indicated that one of my legs was several inches shorter than the other. But then she told me that they were going to take an x-ray of my spine. After the x-ray was taken, the doctor returned she placed the film on an imaging device and then proceeded to point out what I could now clearly see with my own eyes, that my spine was out of alignment. But not only was it out of alignment, but it had actually began to curve like it was beginning to form the letter S. She then went on to explain the many ways in which our spines can become misaligned. But then she said something that struck me. She said that when our spines are out of alignment, that over a period of time, our musculoskeletal system begins to adjust and adapt to the misalignment. In other words, not only was my spine out of alignment, but my muscles had adjusted and adapted themselves to the misalignment. It was why one of my legs was longer than the other, and the principal reason why I had begun to experience discomfort in my back after walking for a period of time. 
But after informing me that one of my legs was longer than the other, and after showing me that my spine was out of alignment and telling me that my muscles had adjusted and adapted themselves to the misalignment, after telling me what I considered to be the bad news, she then told me that she had some good news. She told me that while she could not guarantee that my spine would become perfectly straight again, she told me that it would become much straighter than it was. But then she said that if it was going to become straighter, then it would take some time and it would take me being willing to undergo a series of adjustments. That is, I would have to come in on a regular basis. She then went on to explain that if I was willing to invest the time and subject myself to a series of routine adjustments, not only would my spine become straighter, but my muscles would readjust themselves to the new alignment. And I believe that the experience that I had with my chiropractor may provide some insight and be instructive for those that the Apostle Paul refers to as the body of Christ, specifically the body of believers who were at the church called Corinth. Now Corinth was a church that had some issues. And so they reached out to the Apostle Paul. They wrote him a letter. And 1 Corinthians is Paul's response to their letter. And in this response, he addresses the concerns that they have. He talks about the divisions that they were experiencing and a host of other issues. But the gift that the Apostle Paul gives to us in this text is that he reminds the believers that they, the issues that they were facing were largely symptomatic of something deeper. In other words, one way of looking at Paul's response to the church at Corinth is that the first 11 chapters of Paul's letter is equivalent of an x-ray that Paul has taken of the church. And according to the results, he found that the spine of the Corinthian church was out of alignment. He acknowledged that while the divisions within the church were real, they were symptomatic of something much deeper. While the lack of accountability and the willingness to turn a blind eye to the behavior that was clearly inappropriate was real, it was symptomatic of a deeper issue. While the abuses at the Lord's Supper were a problem, they too were symptomatic of a deeper issue. A deeper issue that I believe he describes well in the third chapter of 1 Corinthians where he says, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but rather as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for solid food. Even now you are still not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving according to human inclinations? In other words, what the Apostle Paul is suggesting is that the results of the x-ray have revealed some telling things about the church at Corinth. It has revealed that the spine of the Corinthian church is out of alignment. Indeed, the spine of the church is crooked. It is the kind of alignment that occurs when the Holy Spirit is no longer at the center of the church's work and Jesus is no longer central to the church's worship. It is the kind of alignment that occurs when, when divine inspiration has been supplanted by what the Apostle Paul refers to as human inclination. And I would remind us that as the musculoskeletal system adjusts and adapts to the spine when it is out of place or out of alignment in the human body, so the systems of a church begin to adjust themselves to the misalignment of the church's spine. Paul describes one of the ways this misalignment rooted in human inclinations manifests itself when he says, for when one says, I belong to Paul, and another says, I belong to Apollos, are they not merely human? In other words, according to Paul, one of the things that lies at the heart of human inclination are allegiances and alliances that are rooted in competition and power and in control. And this begs the question for the North Georgia Conference and for the United Church at this time in our history. Are the divisions and fighting and battles and potential split that stands on the horizon symptomatic of something much deeper within the life of our church? 
are our alliances with the left, with the right, with the center, with the center left and center right, indicative of or symptomatic of something much deeper going on within the life of the United Methodist Church. Could it be if we took the time to examine ourselves, what might be revealed is the same thing that the Apostle Paul discovered was plaguing the church at Corinth, that their symptoms were the result of infantile behavior steeped in a church culture that caters to human inclinations rooted in competition competition where we align ourselves, measure ourselves, and determine worth and value based on size and, and on numbers and on money. Indeed, might it be that the difficulties of our church, that uh, our church are facing at history, be the result of the church's spine being out of alignment? Could it be that the musculoskeletal system of the church, our ministries, our agencies, and the host of other components of our church have adjusted and adapted themselves to this misalignment? To be sure, a person can still walk with a crooked spine. A person can still run with a crooked spine. We just won't be walking and running the way that God intended for us to walk and run. We'll still be able to move, but we won't be able to do all that God wants us to do for Christ. Indeed, this is one of the reasons why I'm grateful for Paul's instruction in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. In fact, I believe that chapter 12 provides a course of action to get the spine of the church at Corinth back in proper alignment. Paul is providing for them a series of adjustments that will straighten out the church's spine. And when the spine of the church is straight, the internal workings of the church will work better. The church will walk more upright and the church will also possess the flexibility and nimbleness necessary to adapt and to make changes. And I want to suggest at least three things that the Apostle Paul offers as part of a series of adjustments for the church at Corinth and for us. The first is what Paul says in verse seven, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. One of the stories I love to tell is a story about a missionary who traveled quite extensively throughout the continent of Africa. And on one occasion during his travels, he found himself in a small village. And on this particular day, he was in the company of the children of this village who were sitting together and playing. And so he decided that he would introduce something different into their play. There was a tree that was standing some distance away. And he said to the children that he would give a piece of candy to the first child to arrive at that tree. And it was then that he witnessed something that he had not only not anticipated, but something for which he was not prepared. One child grabbed the hand of another child, and that child proceeded to grab the hand of another child, who then grabbed the hand of another child, who grabbed the hand of another child, so on and so on, until all of the children were holding hands. And then and only then did they take off running in unison and all of them arrived at the tree at exactly the same time. In essence, what this missionary had done was he attempted to introduce into the play life of those children a way of being where priority was given to competition. That is to say, whoever reached the tree first was the winner and the winner would be rewarded. In his mind, there could only be one winner and the reward was based upon one person winning. But what he encountered was a group of African children whose upbringing and orientation towards the world was not rooted in competition. Rather, these African children's orientation towards life was rooted in what the Apostle Paul refers to in the 12th chapter of our text as the common good. It is an orientation towards living where a premium was placed on community and cooperation and each person was deemed to be of inestimable worth. It was an orientation towards life where competition was recognized and valued, but not at 
at the expense of or to the detriment of the commonwealth or the well-being of the entire community. And I want to suggest to us that it may be a failure to properly grapple with this sense of the common good that might lie at the heart of our nation's inability to address our current struggles. For what protesters are saying is that the spine of this nation has been out of alignment for a very long time. And while this nation's institutions and systems have adapted to our nation's spine being out of alignment and that while many have suffered because this nation's spine remains out of alignment there is a desire for this nation to be healthy so that it can work well for every citizen in this country indeed adherence to the common good is an essential tenet of our nation that takes its health seriously as well as a church that desires to be an effective witness for Christ. It is the common good, not what the Apostle Paul refers to as the human inclinations of people bent on remaining on a diet of infant milk all their lives and that create divisions and alliances rooted in competition that must be a part of the adjustment the church is willing to undertake for effect of witnessing in this world. But in addition to the common good being an essential element and correcting the church's alignment, Paul speaks to what I call the bandwidth of a church that is seeking to be properly aligned. He describes it as a church that has one body but many members. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying to the community of believers at Corinth that those who gather in the name of Christ and under the power of the Holy Spirit possess the gravitas to embrace the variety of gifts given to the church by God and the variety of people who have been called by God to serve God's church. Where there is no bandwidth to embrace these variety of gifts and people that God has given to this church, then it is indicative of a church's willingness to operate with a spine that is out of alignment. The church will still be able to function, but the church's witness will be diminished. But in addition to the common good and the church practicing increased bandwidth, the third thing that is a component of Paul's series of adjustments for the Corinthian church is the church's capacity to value the people the way God values them. And by valuing them, the Apostle Paul means that the church operates from a position that our well-being is inextricably bound together with the well-being of others. That we share in each other's joys as well as each other's sorrows. And then finally, Paul tells us that the Holy Spirit must be central to the work of God's church. The late Dr. Samuel Proctor tells the story of a man who owned the compass. And he said that whenever that man opened that compass, the arrow of the compass was pointing to the north. One day someone broke into this man's home and stole some of his jewelry and among the items taken was that compass. And when that thief opened the compass, the arrow of the compass was pointing to the north. One day the thief sold the compass to a fisherman and when that fisherman opened the compass, the arrow of the compass was pointing to the north. One day while out fishing, the fisherman accidentally dropped the compass overboard and, and then one day a diver came along and found it. And when the diver opened the compass, it was still pointing to the north. And Dr. Proctor said that the reason that the arrow of the compass was always pointing to the north is because there was a metal on the inside of that compass called a lodestone that always caused the arrow to point to magnetic north. The conventional wisdom was that if you know where north is, you should be able to determine which direction you need to go in. Well, the Holy Spirit is the lodestone for the church of Jesus Christ. 
Holy Spirit is who keeps the church pointed in the right direction. The Holy Spirit grounds the church of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that keeps the church true to the church's mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit equips and, and empowers the church for service and for effective witness in this world. The Holy Spirit gives the power and the courage and the desire to be in right communion with God's people, both Christian and non -Christian. Indeed, when the Holy Spirit is present, then perhaps instead of talking about what tribe we belong to, we will lend our voices to the echo of the prophet Isaiah, a voice that cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill will be made low and the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all God's people will see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Amen and amen. At this time, we ask your response to the word. The response to the word today is to the church. So for those seeking God in their life, or wanting more, wanting to know more about the faith or joining the church, please notify Pastor George via, Pastor George via the chat or you can email him and his email address is george.lanier at ngumc.net. Another way we can respond to the word is through our giving. Poplar Spring has two ways of giving. Um, they're gonna put up a chat with the link for you to give. And if you click on that link, it will take you to our given site. Or you can mail in your payment. You can also mail in your tithes and your offering to New Redemption. And their address is on the website. And we ask that you please give for our mission. At this time, we would like to thank Reverend Dr. Byron Thompson for the message today. We give our thanks to our virtual team members. Everyone put in so much work to make today happen. And we just wanna say thank you. On behalf of Reverend George Lanier, we thank you and Sister Shirley Holm, our worship team leader. Now let us prepare to go. Our benediction. We have been embraced by the love of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and blessed by Jesus to go into this world to offer healing and hope. Go in peace. Amen. Our announcements are as follow. Intercessory prayer is held on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Bible study is held on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Church anniversary, November 22nd. Cluster charge conference, November 12th.